Alice Resnicki here from Sunflower and very excited to say that today we have a, a friend of mine and a very well-known and successful actor, Jonathan Hyde. Um, John, when I speak to young people, they say to me, yeah, I want to know if he's credible. Not you, just generally when I talk about people say, what makes this person credible? Why should I listen? So John, could you maybe please describe some of the major acting experiences you've had um, and some of the roles that people may know you from, please? Oh, Lord. Well, we would, um, film-wise, I suppose it'd have to be Titanic, Jumanji, The Mummy, Richie Rich, Anaconda. Um, television, it might be, well, I did a series back in the 80s called Shadow of the Noose, playing a, um, a, a barrister called Sir Edward Marshall Hall, known as The Great Defender. Um, since that time, more recently, I suppose, the standard... Uh, roles come up in things like Endeavour and Foil's War and um, currently in America um, I'm doing The Strain, Guillermo del Toro, um, uh, Apocalyptic Nightmare Caper, which is uh, pretty extraordinary. We've done three seasons, we might go to five. We'll wait and see. Well, that's... Um a very, very uh, incredible list of um, experiences and uh, roles and uh, films and programs. Could you point out maybe some of the people that you've worked with along the way? So I know, for example, you've worked with Morgan Freeman and John Cusack. Who are some of the other big names that young people might recognise? Um, Ian McKellen, um, Gandalf, although when I worked with him, he was Lear uh, and I was the Earl of Kent. Um, and I've worked for Robin, with Robin Williams, um, on two films, actually. One was called um, Being There, um, which is which was a, a Bill Forsyth movie that didn't go very far. And um, Jumanji, which, of course, um, went a whole lot further. That, that, that really grabbed everybody. Um, Great film. I've made... I've cooked bacon and eggs for Lauren Bacall um, in New York. Uh, I've yes, got, and millions of actors that, that one has worked with. I've got Kate way. Winslet. Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio, you've worked with yeah. director yeah. James Cameron, yeah. John Voight, yeah. favourite actor of yeah. mine. Yeah, yeah, loads. But you can you can you can trawl them all up. Or, you know, as one goes along, you you bump into all sorts of people. Famous um, um, favourite director James Cameron or Alistair Resnicki of Sunflower? Oh, I'd say the uh, the latter. Um, Obviously, Cameron was was uh, was terrific. Very volatile. Very incredibly creative. Very inventive. He invented a. Um, a, a mechanism for the uh, for the tilting of the vehicle, a, a, um, an amazing uh, bit of hydraulics um, that he invented along the way, so we could uh, tilt the vessel in the studio, as it were, and then uh, drench it, drain it, put it to flat, and, and tilt it again. Um, all of that was just part of his skill set. He he can light anything, shoot anything. Um, and direct along the way and write things. So yeah, he's a he was a clever cookie. I think I think the um, film Titanic. Obviously, most people would agree, incredible film. Um, you know, to know that you were in that is is incredible in itself. Um, I remember when we went to see it. I mean, there were people at school. I was sixteen at the time. It's nearly twenty years ago, nineteen ninety seven, if I remember rightly. And yeah. you know, people were going three, four times 20 of us went I mean at first I, you know, I was a 16 year old boy I went because there were 10 girls going and I was going to sit next yeah, to Becky right, right, um, right. but I remember coming out and being absolutely blown away what was it like to work on such a I think it was one of the sort of biggest budget films of all time and highest, second highest grossing film of all time what was it like oh well I mean it was it was a caper um, filming in Mexico uh, I remember once we were driving just to, just impressions isn't what you get just driving down to actually, I wasn't filming that night, but I was driving. We were driving down to to um, a place south of uh, of Rosarito, which is where they in Mexico where they were shooting. But just to drive down the the highway and see this extraordinary vessel, um, sitting in this huge kind of tank, with not one but two moons, because they were lighting big lighting uh, balloons that they used, two moons. A clear, starry sky, this extraordinary lit vessel. They had 3,000 miles of, of uh, cable just to light the vessel. Because every, you know, put a light bulb in every, in every porthole and so on. 
we were going down to eat lobster uh, and, um, and we went to a lovely place till somebody saw a rat uh, run across the kitchen floor and then we went somewhere else. But uh, yeah, those, those, uh, those events, those heady events were, were pretty extraordinary. Of course, if you look at a Titanic, you will see that an awful lot of it is shot at night. And night shoots are the most um, strangely unbalancing um, things because your, your, your whole body clock gets thrown completely out of kilter. You get picked up at five in the afternoon. You end up going to bed just as the sun is coming up around about 7 a.m. Um, that's fairly standard in most uh, films, one way or another. I've done that in a, almost every film I think I've been in. Um, but in this instance, it was it was very protracted because there was there was so much of of the thing happens at night. And you've, you'd obviously been in the business a long time by then. But was there? How did that opportunity come about? Were you recommended for the role? Were you, did you have to audition? Did you meet someone by chance? You know who who, who put you forward? How mm. did that come about, John? Well. <clears throat> Did you, just for people who may have not seen the film for a while or may have not seen it, John's character was Bruce Ismay. As I understand it, Bruce Ismay owned or managed the White Star Liner, which owned the Titanic. John's role was a central character um, in the film as someone pushing for the ship to go quicker and faster to, yeah. to get to America. It was kind of the driving force in a way, putting pressure on the captain. So this was a significant role in a major film. And, and actually, I think one of the best parts of the film for me when I watched it at 16, and I'm not just saying this to, because John's here now and I've told him before, but was the moment where John's character makes a decision to get on a lifeboat and the, one of the crewmen says, take them down, seeing John's character sort of jump shipper, basically. And I think for me, why it was one of the most powerful moments and a great performance, even though it's only a few seconds, is because it answers that, it, or it asks that moral question, what would I do in that? And John's character is the moral question, really. And I think he played oh. it beautifully. And I'm oh, not just saying you. that because he's here, but go and watch that clip. In fact, I'm going to post a link of it because there's a and, YouTube clip. And, and, and on, on, on the back of that, interesting that when a judge says, when you've been, when you've been found guilty in a court of law, um, the judge says, take him down. Uh, so it's just, it's just a, a slight irony that, that when he said, take them down, it has it has a sort of it has a sort of a, a resonance which is which is broader than just get the boat down into the water. And what what was what was great because I watched the clip again this morning is as those words are said by the person on the ship, John's character closes his eyes with that despair of, oh I know I've just morally bankrupt myself, and and lowers the boat that goes on, and and it and it it does something to you inside because you can you you would want to survive yet you should not survive mm -hmm. that that shows on the highest level possible your acting skills undoubtedly your your skills are of the highest caliber because you are there in that pivotal role at those pivotal moments but going outside of that because i'm I want these, all of these resources are about people trying to understand the softer skills, the employability mm. skills, the mm. things that anyone can do today with yeah. no money yeah. to try and give themselves the biggest opportunity. Yeah. Um, we'll go into that, but specifically, how did Titanic come about for you, John? Right. Well, I was doing, this is the way sometimes momentum is important to, to, um, to try and, and uh, jump from one, from one project to another is very useful. If you can build any kind of momentum, then I think it works really, really well. In this instance, I was filming Anaconda. Uh, we'd spent seven weeks uh, in Brazil, in Manaus, which is where the, the, the Amazon and the Negro come together. That's a little, little town which was famous for rubber production before the Brits stole the, uh, the, uh, the rubber plants from Brazil and took them to Malaya where they actually um, started um, growing rubber um, in plantation form, and that's effectively killed the organic rubber trade in, uh, in Brazil. So we were there for seven weeks, and then we went back to, to, uh, to um, Los Angeles and filmed um, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and that's when I was told that there was interest in my playing Ismay in Titanic, a, a big movie that Fox and Paramount were putting together, directed by James Cameron. So I went and met James Cameron and put myself on tape 
uh, they filmed me do a, a little bit of a scene and we talked at length and then I was offered the role because I think I looked a bit like Ismay um, and they were very um, happy to have me and I was very happy to go along with that. Wow, incredible. Well, um, you know, that sounds... It's an audition, just you've got to put yourself out there and, and uh, they will select you or not. And, you know, aside from, say, um, you know, obviously the acting skill, what are you doing before, a, before an audition, say, you know, the day before, an hour before, other than the text? Are you checking the detail of where the venue is? Are you planning three hours worth of journey time for one hour? Are you trying to eliminate any silly little problem? Yes. Um, like turning up to the wrong venue at the wrong time or the wrong yes. room? I do. I check everything. I check everything carefully. I'm a, t I'm a notorious early bird. If I'm t taking a flight, I like to be there really in good time, in better than good time, in very good time. Uh, if I'm doing an audition, I like to calculate that I will allow more time in case there's a snafu, uh, so that if something does go wrong, I'm not I'm not uh, going to panic. I did spend nine years in boarding school. And that was uh, quite a, in in those days because I'm 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 an old codger really. Um, in those days, boarding schools were really quite severe. You could be beaten for not getting your pass mark in Latin roots, for example. I did Latin, and my pass mark was 27. And if I got 24, then I was given three with a strap um, to to make sure that that I concentrated a little bit harder and, and focused a little bit better. So having said that, you know, then the, we, we were not permitted to be late. If you were late, you were beaten. Um, so that, in a funny sort of way, did have some sort of impact. It did act as a, as a kind of, as a, a bit of a stimulus <laughs> to sort of get me there on time. Not that I expect that any casting director or anybody else would slap me across the face or ask me to bend over nowadays. Um, Certainly not the ones I auditioned for, anyway. Um, but that was that was that was. I I'm an early person. I so, like to be well, well, and well and truly prepared. So the takeaway from that is, you know, great timekeeping, always early, no excuses, attention to detail. Um, three three or four soft skills there, which are which are kind of rules. If, if someone's turning up, like we see a lot you know, my boss, this and the other, they're not going to make it in the industry, are they? Because the opportunities aren't going to open for them. No, you can't. You, you just can't. I mean, if, if something is... Of course, we our industry is, is quite forgiving in, in many respects. I mean, if you have a family tragedy, then, of course, people say, of course, you know, you, you, you have to attend to that. And, you know, it's not as though, you know, everything becomes subject to the, the, the great drive of uh, of uh, movie making having said that actors are of course crucial you can't shoot a scene without the actor you just can't do it um so from that point of view we we we, we have to be completely and utterly reliable and we have to make sure that we turn up on time and we're given a lot of leeway sometimes you know a lot of actors are not allowed to go skiing they're not allowed to go rock climbing there are certain things which we're not allowed to do because basically we're too valuable a resource, especially if we've spent seven or eight weeks filming and all of a sudden you fall off a cliff and they have to shoot the seven or eight weeks all over again and that becomes prohibitively expensive. So, yeah. Well, that cuts me out because I go rock climbing and uh, skiing at the same You're time. Out. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, no can do. I'm done. No. John, how and when did your passion for acting, the acting business, start? Where, where, where did this all come from? Oh, Lord. It's hard to know, isn't it? I think when my. My sister used to pull my shorts down at parties. They used to, I was little, I was sort of three or four. And I used to, there'd be gales of laughter. People would be hooting and screaming with laughter. I never saw the, the funny side of it. To be exposed by your elder sister, you know, in a humiliating circumstance never struck me as being the right way forward. But nevertheless, um, I suppose the, 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 the idea of, you know, being able to attract laughter was, uh, was something that, um, actually quite appealed to me and still does. If you can make people laugh, you know, you can, presumably, you can defang them from all sorts of other sort of aggressive uh, behaviours. So I suppose I've always thought that wit was, um, was a, a, leading, um, a leading skill. Keep the twinkle. Don't forget to see this, the funny side of, e of everything, if you can. Um, some things are beyond funny, I know that. But uh, 
I have noticed that actually from watching some of the interviews um, which are online of yourself and there's a lot of humour running through it quite a lot of the time you just sat down three or four minutes talking to a news crew or thing and actually you know I found myself laughing three or four times in those three or four minutes maybe sometimes more and I thought I class humour as a soft skill. You can diffuse a situation. Oh, yeah. You can have, you know, I, I've always been a little bit too cheeky throughout my career, but I've known the place for humour and I've used it in as a soft skill. You know, make people laugh, mm. push the boundaries a little bit. People might warm to you and it's given me opportunities. So I'd class that as another soft skill. It seems like maybe you do as well. And I've certainly seen it demonstrated on, on the interviews and things like that. Yeah, I, th I think it's, you know, don't, don't take it too seriously, of course, is, the, is, the, is the, the adverse side of that. You know, is to say, for goodness sake, you you know, it's it's uh, there are important things in life, and careers are important. Um, but we're playing. Do you mean that as as humans we're playing, and we get the opportunity to playing, or as actors we're playing? You know, can can anyone give themselves that freedom to play? And by by playing, they might actually lead themselves into roles that, by playing mm. by the rules, might not get them where well, they want Ma to. Marlon Brando said a wonderful thing, you know, because one of his um, sycophantic interviewers was saying, but you're so amazing, you're the most amazing actor in the world. And, oh, Marlon, you're just incredible. And he said, everybody acts. And she said, no, surely they don't. And he says, get out of here. He said, S you know, you see a neighbor, you say, good day, top of the morning to you. And then your your thought might be you lousy son of a bitch. You know, you the, the, we all act to the, you know that's that's to do with our 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 social vigilance, our uh, desire not to blatantly sort of cause offence. You know, we do exert a certain amount of vigilance socially, and that requires a certain amount of acting. You don't want to see your, you know auntie so and so you dragged along by your folks to see to take tea and you think this is going to be three hours of, of total nightmare. I don't want to be there, but it's important that one learns the social skill of being able to smile. And do you know, by the by, that if you can hear if somebody's smiling or not on the phone? Yes, well, I was reading about... if they're not smiling, you can hear it. Mm. And that's interesting. That's a soft skill, surely, that if somebody is... is, is tasked with answering phone calls that they should sound as pleasant and as amenable as possible. I can tell when somebody's going to stick their, dig their heels in and not help. I can hear a door slamming mentally. Absolutely. Do you, the link I'm trying to demonstrate to say people 13 to 24 who are starting out and maybe trying to build their careers is, you know, it's not about your YouTube channel. It's not about how good you think you are. It's about the opportunities you end up getting. And the link there is my career, my colleagues' careers are full of opportunities open up off the back of displaying a soft skill. More so than mm. sometimes the specialist knowledge. Have well, you had opportunities opened up because you're humorous, personable, early, on time, smiling, happy? I know you need the acting ability, but has that over the course, do you think, give, you know, do you feel like those sorts of things have gone, actually, I probably wouldn't have been introduced to Joe Bloggs if I hadn't been that type of person? Well, interestingly, there's a director who shall remain nameless doing a film, one of the, well, the, the five blockbusters that I mentioned, who cast people specifically on their amenability, their, 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 their relaxed uh, demeanour, their ability to have a, a laugh along the way because his previous movie had had an actress, I'll say that, an actor, female actor, uh, who, uh, who was extremely demanding and very, very fussy and, and an absolute pain in the ass. And it was a nightmare. And he cast specifically on what you'd call soft skills, specifically. So from that point of view, the answer is yes. So when, if you hear stories about people not turning up on time to their shift, whether it's in a coffee shop or whether it's on a movie set or making excuses because of the bus or not spell checking emails, do you think they're missing the value of soft skills? Of course. I mean, I know that there's, that, that, that in, another, in a television project I did, there was a specific actor who was always half an hour late and she... Um, she didn't. Uh, she didn't last um, as long as she might have.
because it was just too it was too, it was too wearing on the on the schedule. So they had to let her go. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, the down, the the downsides of the negative effects. I talk mm. about this much more in my ebook, small steps, big leaps. Um, mm. but frequently, it's it's the small soft skills which open up the biggest opportunities. So go and have a look at that. It's on one of the pages on the site. Um, I was going to talk about the humour in your interviews, but we've we've mentioned to that. We've mentioned that. Um, building your network. How important is it being? I think you know networking or building a network is another soft skill. Staying in touch. Um, is that important to you? Has that been no, important? Not at all. Fred, I don't. I don't do it. Really? I don't do Facebook, Twitter. I, I mean, the thing. kind of the the real world relationships in oh. terms of you know being by being friends with Serene McKellen, are you therefore in certain circles where you might introduce, be introduced or meet oh, other absolutely. actors? You know, oh, yeah, is yeah. that important? From that to point you? of view, I, well, it, it it it. I always think essentially to let the work do the talking. That's my first thing. That that in terms of any kind of career advance, is just do the, do the job really well. Um, less to do with who you get to meet at a cocktail party or, or what have you. And I've rarely gotten any work on the, on the back of, of, having, of having been at the right party at the right moment. I, I don't think that's ever happened to me. I know it does happen. But at last, it, 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 um, it, <laughs> I'm not one of the beneficiaries of that, of that specific... Um, mode you know that 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 i i tend to stay back a bit of course if one is creative in other words rather than interpretive an actor interprets a role and certainly if you're doing film and television then you there is a certain creative um um capability you you can make suggestions change lines perhaps even change plot to some degree at least the the the, the this, this, the, the currency of the plot can, can, can change. But essentially, um, we are interpretive. We just interpret. To create means you, you start with an idea and you build it. And in that circumstance, then you have to talk to a lot more people because you've got to convince that many more people that this is a good idea. You have to sell the idea rather than sell a skill. And... Do you look people in the eye when you meet them? Do you, are hmm. you, a lot of actors aren't necessarily confident. So, okay, let me reframe my point. People struggle with confidence. Um, you know, I struggle with confidence sometimes. You, you know, you have, to, you have to take your moment, take your opportunity. I'm a big, big, big advocate of people going for the moment. Recently I ended up in a lift with Sir Richard Branson at an education conference and had my mic, did an interview, and up on the screen on the video it says, you know, take your chance, take your moment. You know, those situations are, you know, they're, they're not commonplace. They're, they're, they're you know, slightly scary when they come around. I've had probably about 10 of those where had I not taken my moment, I wouldn't have become the editor of ITN. I wouldn't mm. have become the TV director. I wouldn't have got that chance. Could you give us some tips on, on confidence or like presence or faking confidence? Well, b b being an actor is a strange thing because often, of course, you have to dis you have to inhabit i was going to say display you don't display anything but you have to inhabit sometimes you know neurosis uh total lack of confidence depending on who you are and what what your character is and the the, the situation you're in um even if you're outwardly confident there might be a, a, a you might be called upon to be um breaking up inside you know this is frequently Often the most interesting form of acting is when you see people struggling not to cry, struggling not to commit themselves to some to some uh, um, uh, act of, of one kind or another. That's the resistances are, are sometimes very interesting. But you're talking generally about just being able to look someone in the eye and and be generally sort of open. I'm not a madly open person, but I do value candor, and I and if people do. Uh, show goodwill, the word I would use, it comes back in spades. It really is worth remembering that if you throw one, throw your, your, your worries aside and just face, face the world, have some faith, you know, in that, that somebody isn't going to attack you with a, with a machete, you know, uh, walking down the street, no matter how rich your imagination is. And, and, uh, Give everyone the time of day. I, I've, 
In the old days, when I was a kid, you know, for example, we had a set of, of, of rules, of behavior, that you just did. They're just rules of, of courtesy. You, if a, 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 an adult came into the room, you stood up. If somebody was introduced, you shook their hand. You certainly engaged, you, you certainly uh, looked at them. I walked into rooms, you know, where people haven't even lifted their head from the newspaper they're reading. Uh, in houses, you know, where the teenagers are sitting around. Um, people notice that. We're, we're, we're much more instinctively, ac acutely aware of our surrounding than people would think. And so I think that those tiny gestures can resonate a lot more than one would imagine. You know, really valuable um, thoughts there. And I'd say that, you know, frustration for a lot of people, certainly in business, whatever business is, is the mobile phone technology. Um, what do you what do you think about you know this head constantly in the mobile phone is certainly work environments or yeah yeah it's interesting isn't it I mean I was in Cuba in January just just on a on a on a look see just having a holiday it was fascinating and, and interesting but one of the most interesting things was because there isn't a they're not you know deluged they're not on an avalanche of of toys which is what which is what um, we are we have. You know, everyone's got their head, you know, buried in some music of some kind or other, or listening to something. And and uh, you know, uh, but in Cuba, everyone was engaged with each other. Everyone was talking. The kids were all improvising games. A lot of pl people would play football in the street. They'd drag out a couple of metal goalposts. They'd be kicking the ball, you know, trying to score and everything. And then suddenly a car would come along. They'd pull the, they'd pull them out of the way. The car would go through. They'd put them back. Now that's just the, you know, that's just the, the, the mechanics of, of, of poverty in a way that, that, that's been imposed, of course, by this ludicrous blockade that was imposed after the revolution. And, um, you know, you think, well, that's what a waste of time and energy that was. Thank God that there's some sort of rapprochement has happened recently. But that was very interesting to me that, that because people didn't have the, the distractions, they were more engaged. Um, I've certainly found that um, I, I was very lucky. We didn't have phones. We had kind of computers, SNESs, whatever. We didn't have that distraction. So an opportunity when it came up was an opportunity. And it might be working an 18 hour shift in a company which you're not particularly want to end up in in five years time. But it was an opportunity in the direction of where you wanted to go. I probably did my 10,000 hours, as they say you're supposed to do, by sort of 16, 17, got an apprenticeship, been to college, been to uni, worked, self-employed, employed. Mm, employed. Mm. I've seen it from all different sides of the coin. So many people now that I meet, even during that initial meet, the phone is more important than I am, Ooh, which is, which no, is, no, no. yeah, Don't do that. no, no, no. And also we've had probably no 20 people where, do you know what? I don't care if you like me, like our business, don't like our business. We do a lot of sort of cool projects, by the way. Um, but do you know what? Use and abuse us as people as your stepping stone to the next. So keep a good rapport with us. We yeah. get people more interested in their phone and the opportunities the phone seems to provide because they can look at anything and go anywhere. And I just think you're going to struggle because the old school, <laughs> they don't trade off that. They trade off engagement with human beings. And so mm. I'd point out to people, your phone is, I'd say your, your phone is an amazing asset that you have. And it's a bit like, you know, the, the new axe, but I use it to get the information I need to learn the thing I need to do to book the ticket to get to the place to get the opportunity that is going to get me to where I want to be ultimately and yeah I watch a little bit of YouTube every now and again and, and have fun this is kind of my lightsaber that I'm using to kind of cut through that might sound silly I get opportunities in abundance I'm sorry with Jonathan Hyde from Titanic you know do you know what I mean like the proofs in the pudding I'm in lifts with Richard Branson you might have a billion pound idea but you've got to learn how to get into lift I tell you this it's soft skills and no distraction from the nonsense which is the kind yeah. of secret yeah. source so yeah. you know try try, try go and experiment is what I would say yeah and learn to write 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 longhand for goodness sake I mean you know there might just be a power outage and uh, suddenly you know who knows I mean I know that we get close to almost meltdown with with uh, with the amount of usage on broadband and so on but you know it doesn't hurt to just think of what might happen if if the electrics do fail and you have to send a letter learn to write learn to spell it doesn't hurt remember things rather than just rely on something push a button and it tells you everything so our our memory skills which I'm, I'm glad to be an actor because I have to 
particularly in theatre, which I've done loads of more than anything else, you've got to remember the lines. So committing to memory, detail, is vital. We have... Um it's not uncommon for us to post a job and have 20 applicants and 19 have to go straight in the bin because of maybe one to five spell of mistakes. The company name's spelled wrong, my name's spelled wrong, the colleague's no. name's spelled wrong. The, the problem is, is it's such cutthroat that it can be one spelling mistake on the first line and, and that's, enough, that's, that's the judgment made. This person hasn't got the due diligence due diligence to check this enough. Mm. Therefore, you know, when I'm working with the NHS and they're asking me to say, do X, Y, and Z where it involves language, We've just made films which is about saving babies' lives. If you can't get a CV um, typed up and spelt checked, then you can't come and work on one of our scripts where the wrong word could be the difference between potentially life and death. I know it's an extreme example. These are the realities mm -hmm. in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, in John's case, you might turn up, you know, you might not read a note properly, turn up to the wrong location. That could be £10,000 worth of filming costs because you're two miles away. You know, attention to detail, spell checking. We have a reading and writing. There is a real big problem. It's go and look at the statistics, type, type it into Google. There's all sorts of reports. You will be at a major advantage if you value this highly. That doesn't mean you have to be brilliant at reading and writing, like as in like I spell loads of words wrong, but I'll be the person who checks each email three times before it gets sent. It's about the process and the mechanisms you put in place. Once again, if you go over to sunflowereducation.co.uk, there's um, a Grammarly tool. There's some stuff on there about reading and writing. You've got videos on there from Bill Gates, Warren Buffett. They're the most financially successful people in the world. They talk about the love of reading and the importance of it. Um, there's my rant about reading and writing. Um, John, um, I'll put some words out there. Sophistication, talent, charm, wit, enthusiasm, good looks. These are all words I'd use to describe me. What <laughs> words? What words would you use to describe you? And then I'm going to say some words like credibility. Maybe you could say a couple of words. So maybe we'll start with that one. Credibility. What does that mean to you? Um, well, in terms of what I do, um, am I being believed? Is what I'm doing believable rather than credible? I mean, uh, it's more of a, it's not a term I use an awful lot because it's it's kind of loaded. But, but certainly what I have to do is, is convince on a number of levels. Um, as I said, sometimes what an actor says as a character is not necessarily what they're thinking. They're actually playing two things at once. Um, there may be outward confidence, masking uh, inner dismay, uh, or the other way around. You can have somebody appearing to be very downcast, very broken, very dismayed. Actually, what they're doing is stringing somebody along. They're actually, they're actually using it. They're, they're deploying a particular psychological weapon. In other words, I'm so vulnerable. Please don't hit me. Please don't hit me. Um, but basically, they're, they're using passive aggression. So there, there are all sorts of doubles, is what I call them which is slightly more, it's slightly more snared up and slightly more complex than just credibility. And does it, would it fall into two camps potentially with, you know, you're a credible actor, you're always going to be a credible actor, you trade off that, you get new... Incredible, I think incredible actor is better than credible. Always go for incredible. My bad. And you have to be, you have to be credible as a professional. People have to trust you are. Absolutely. You, you just do it... Say as you do, do as you say, you know, um, that, that's just, you know, uh, all the things you mentioned, you know, I mean, otherwise we'll, we'll replicate, but essentially, you know, learn the lines, turn up on time, when you finish, get off, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Bog off. Yes. <laughs> um, business you know you you you're an actor but actually you you're your own business in many ways aren't you and you're in a business yeah. how much yeah. of your thought is split between you know jonathan hyde the actor jonathan hyde the businessman well i don't i mean business is 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 a weird thing i mean if, if i were a a, a, a genuinely a, a, a creative writer which i sort of i i have written a script it's it sits in a drawer um but if i were somebody who followed through and did both wrote it, then tried to sell it, then saw oversaw the making of it, then then my off-stage skills would be very much um, more tested. 
because uh, I'm essentially quite quite um, quite lazy in some respects. But that's only to do with the downtime, the, the the amount of opportunities that I have, the the amount of passion I choose to put into the business when I'm not actually doing the work that I've been hired to do. Um, so there's a, there, there, there's a certain amount of wiggle room there and stretch depending on circumstance really. You've been swimming this morning. I know that's something you do quite regularly. Yeah. You've just come over, having to, uh, yeah, you, you, you've just come around after a swim. Um, health, how important is your, your health? Oh, I think it's important for the mind. It's good for the mind. They say that, you know, that if you, if you, if you do a lot of exercise, it's terribly good for the, for the, for the brain. Uh, and of course it's terribly good for one's, um, for one's morale. I mean, endorphins, those lovely little, it's even a nice word, isn't it? it Remind me of porpoises and dolphins and things. Endorphin sounds like dolphin. Um, they gamble about in the water and they make you feel so much better for having sort of gotten rid of a few of the, um, gremlins. I think that's the other thing it, 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 it helps you do. I'd absolutely recommend it. Obviously, you use your body as an actor, but has has health and fitness been sort of a backdrop to? If I said the last forty years as a professional actor, a yeah. professional person in the all industry? my career, it's been important. I mean, I did um, I did a couple of years playing Captain Hook in a travelling circus, um, uh, Peter Pan. We were in a, a large a tent that held thirteen hundred people, so it required quite a lot of physical, in fact, a huge amount of physical uh, exertion. Uh, we played it in Kensington Gardens in London, we played it at the O2, we played it uh, just opposite the Ferry Building in San Francisco, we played it in Costa Mesa, just south of Los Angeles, and then it went on and did all sorts of things, but I'd had plenty had enough by then. So, and, and that required one to be extremely fit, extremely fit, not just quite fit, but very fit. So yeah, I think fitness is a, is a part of it. I mean, I don't do the muscle stuff because the swimming is, is perfectly sufficient. I know people, you look at a, 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 at a contemporary film body, it's buffed to near perfection. You look at them and the film act, actors in the 70s, they were far less sort of, you know, six packed and, 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 and bulging, you know, but that's just, that's just fashion. I was lucky enough to meet Buzz Aldrin, the astronaut, uh, just a few days back, and he's 86, and it was incredible to see the level of fitness, actually. And it's, okay. um, I mean, obviously, as an astronaut, so he's just literally on a, another level to most human beings, but this person looked fitter than me and most people I know, and he was 86, and uh, it certainly made me think a little bit more about it. <laughs> um, I, I mean, yeah. I know definitely I perform much better when I put in yeah. three, four, five runs a week as opposed to yeah. when I say I'm going to do it. He, um, he, he, he'll do a, he'll, he'll have been on a fitness regime ever since he was in the Air Force. Yeah. So it's mean, just one of those things, you just do it. Yeah. That's the other thing about exercise. Don't think about it, just do it. The minute you think about it, you start rationalizing, it's gone. Good advice then. I'm definitely going to take that. Um, a couple more. Um, flip side to that, dangers of the industry. I mean, obviously you don't have to go into specifics, but I mean, I know in TV I've been exposed to quite long working hours, people who um, then they go in sort of, uh, blow off steam by going to the pub and drinking a lot and then the cycle starts I've seen a lot of that mm. um, drugs things like that in, in different shows but yeah. you know you can easily get you can easily get pulled into the wrong crowds I've seen it happen in different industries people listening to this I don't want you to be the sort of 16 year old with knowing you've got talent um, you know having a little bit of success early on and then getting caught up in hey you know I'm so cool I've seen, yeah. I've seen it happen. Um, you know, if, what advice would you be, would you maybe give or, or, or not give? Um, well, don't, you know, I think have as, have as much fun as you can tolerate. It's never a bad thing. And God knows um, I've woken up on some mornings thinking I must never do that again. And of course, I do it again, but not <laughs> as regularly as I might, which is good. I would say whatever it is you enjoy, whether it's it's um, you know drinking a, a half a quart of um, of uh, vodka or toking on a few joints or whatever, um, just make sure there are days when you can do well without. Just say well, today's a, a, a tidy day. I don't believe in detoxing, by the way. The livers and the kidneys that they're, 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 they're helping to do that anyway, and it keeps them on their toes to give them a good run for their money. So I, I, I'm not a great believer in detoxing. I don't think you can detox. I think you can, you can, you can lessen the amount of poison you push through the system, but that's, that's different. 
Um, you mentioned before about uh, your personal use or lack of personal use of social media. Um, you know, obviously, social media is used to promote the films and the projects you're in. Do you, a lot of people who, who do your job, they will be tweeting, they will be Facebooking. Mm. I don't do a huge amount. I do some for work and things like that, a little bit of personal. My focus, which I think is another soft skill, focusing on the task, trying to achieve objectives. Um, is, it, is that why you don't do all that stuff? Because you actually just want to focus on creation and opportunity? That's my lazy part, I'm afraid. My lazy self is, is you know, I just can't be bothered telling the world what I had for lunch. And I, I'm really not that interested in, in trying to push my political or social or, or any other sort of ideas uh, too much in, in a broad um, forum. I go to a meeting and listen to people talk and talk, uh, you know, and, and, and so on. But the idea of, of just constantly sort of letting the world know what you're up to strikes me as being a bit um, wayward. I, I couldn't think of anything less, more boring, really. But, but, um, and why would anybody be interested in what I had for lunch? Frankly, and you know, go and, go and have your own lunch. <laughs> for goodness' sake. Lifestyle. I know at the moment you're split between, or the last couple of years, been split between England and you're still a working actor, you're still getting new projects. Um, you know, lifestyle. You, you you're part in Canada for periods of the year, and you 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 part in Britain. Yeah. What's that been like? Good. I think uh, you know, travel broadens the mind, as they say. Another cliche, but then. Every cliche has a silver lining. Um, the, the, the beauty of working in Toronto is that it's a wonderfully affable city. People are very relaxed. They're very, they, they look you in the eye and they engage you in conversation sometimes too much. Uh, but, but they're extremely pleasant. And uh, um, to go through a Toronto winter is character building. It can be fun, but then they know how to heat. And they certainly know how to wrap up, so you just follow the follow the basic principles of of, uh, of uh, uh, icy cold winters, and you're absolutely dandy, and it's thrilling. And then last year, I did a a, a film in in London. It was a a, sh a little film. It was a little project, but it is going to the uh, Edinburgh Festival Film Festival this year, which I should be in in a few weeks. I should be very interested to see what that's like, because I think they're delivering me a um, some verdict on it soon uh, and I did a film in Lithuania about the war crimes trials in Tokyo which was fascinating for Netflix I shall be certainly interested to see what that's like that was six and a half weeks in Lithuania which was really interesting very gentle country very relaxed again you think and of course it's always interesting to, to be able to compare and contrast the places you've been with the place you've uh, elected to live, which is, in this case is, uh, is the UK. Fantastic. So I've got a question here from Fran, who's 18. She's an aspiring young actress who has just done a professional piece with Sunflower in the NHS. Um, it's a funny story, really, because it's soft skills related. I was given a masterclass about a year and a half ago to a group of young people interested in working in the arts, media, TV and film. And Fran turned up late and she loudly announced a mid-production meeting that I was hosting that she was here and so that everything could get started, to which I sternly replied, you know, who are you? And she said, I'm Fran, I'm the actress. And she said, and I said, who are you? And I said, I'm the ex-ITN TV director who's currently running this meeting. And I gave her a stern little stare. And you could see this moment of this sort of 16 and a half year old who had a semi big ego. She'll listen to this. She won't mind me saying, have that penny drop moment of going, ah, here's an opportunity. What can I do? And so rather than carrying on the playfulness and the immaturity that she kind of displayed, she came over, she shook my hand, she said, hello, I'm Fran. I'm trying to be an actress. It's great to meet you, which was brilliant. And then we, nice. you know, Good we, recovery, great recovery, soft skills, looking someone in the eyes, shaking hands. That made an impression on me. She was also great in the program we as a group made a couple of weeks later yeah. and she made a, a lasting impression. So a year and a half later, when the NHS said, look, we want to do a, a creative project. We want to have a scene in a hospital where someone collapses. Do you know someone who could play the lead role? I knew I could trust Fran on performance with a little bit of coaching, but more importantly, I knew that I could trust her on a soft skills, employability skills level to represent my company in front of the NHS. So of course she got the gig, she got paid. We've just come to the end of that project. The NHS is very happy and now at 18, she has this big professional piece. That's the power of soft skills. Um, her question for you, John, is um, for young and upcoming actors, what is the best piece of advice you can give other than just getting more acting experience? Oh. 
I suppose, oh, it sounds so feeble to say, keep going. But, but I think that, that, that it's not unusual for potential, you know, enthusiasm to begin to just wane. Because if it doesn't, go and see as much as you can. See theatre. If, if you're interested in acting, go and see theatre. Wherever your local good theatres are, go to them. Wherever you and whenever you can travel to big theatres that are doing great work, then go to them, read reviews, see what, what is good to, 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 to go to and put some money aside to do that. I think that when I, I went to RADA in the early 70s and the best thing I could have done was to go to every, every single production that was in the West End and elsewhere Travel to Stratford on Avon Q for a morning to get a ticket for the Peter Brook Dream, uh, which was worth every kind of millisecond of, of sitting around waiting in a, in a vast queue all day. That 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 not only reinforces your commitment, but it also reinforces your imagination. It gives you it's so much fuel to your soul to be able to see what sort of work is being done and I would really stress theatre as well as film because film is not really the actor's medium in the way that th that a stage is. Um, film is really the directors, editors, cinematographers medium. They're the ones who really control the performance but when you're on a stage basically it's you. Great advice there. I think um... You know, hustle is something which was useful for me. I, you know, my, my parents divorced when I was 14 and I think in a way it was it was good for me. Those sorts of things knock you off balance. Um, and that sometimes can be in a good way. What, what I basically mean is, is I didn't have any connections into the industry. I didn't have necessarily any money or any support hugely at that young age whilst I was trying to figure it out. What I did realize was soft skills were free assets. So anyone who sort of says, well, you know, I couldn't go to Stratford because I can't afford it, you know, get in McDonald's as me and my friends were doing the double shift. I used to cycle to work to save my bus fare. I did that for three months. That got me to Brazil, <laughs> you know, a flight to Brazil and back. Um, you can't make excuses around, well, I can't do that. Every time you're not hustling and get into the opportunity and stand at the back of the stage door to meet the actor or meet the stage director or go up with your business cards that you've printed off yourself, you know, if you wait for permission in this industry, you don't make it in this industry. Yeah, well, I, I went when I, I got through RADA by doing uh, working uh, the crash trolley at the Royal Free Hospital uh, in Hampstead, which I did for th th uh, three summers running. Uh, that was arriving at eight o'clock in the morning uh, and leaving sometimes at nine o'clock at night. Working in I the hospital? Feel, working in the hospital. Um, wheeling people down this weird corridors, which in those days it was a, a, a converted Victorian fever clinic, the old Royal Free Hospital. It had huge flagstones. It was on a, it was on a, a an angle. It was on a, a tilt, so you had to push them up or down this half mile long corridor, and there were no lifts, so we had to carry the, the patients up and down in their wheelchairs or on stretchers, depending on whether they had a heart attack or not. I peel potatoes at RADA to get a free lunch. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. This isn't this isn't a story of, you know, wealthy parents. Here's everything paid for. Do what you want. This is actually I want this. I'm going to earn this. And if this yeah. means peeling potatoes and pushing people in hospitals, I'm going to grind. It had to be. It had to do. It, that that was the only way really to to make ends meet because. Um, because I'm Australian by birth, then I wasn't eligible for any of the wonderful grants that used to apply to um, anybody, really, in whatever tertiary education they were after, whether it was going to a drama school or going to a university, of course, in the, in the golden period. Um, the state paid for, for one's uh, education, tertiary education, which was absolutely remarkable and very enlightened. And I'm afraid to say that we've rather gone backwards on all that but we have to make adjustments according to circumstance so i mean we've spoken about this privately before but 
you know, we're talking about non-instant gratification, really, aren't we? There, there is a little bit of that, especially with phone technology, sort of showing you opportunities. I, I witness that in, from an, an employer's level. People wanting everything now. You're talking about longevity and, and kind of being prepared to grind over the long time. You know, I, I guess has so. that been one of the six reasons that you've had longevity, that you've been prepared to put the work in in different areas to make your dream kind of happen or dreams? Yeah, I, I, I've never had a plan. Okay. I've never had a I've never had a model to think I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do that, and then I'll do that, and then I want to do that. And I know my, my daughter does. She she thinks I've just she's just finished a stage play in Los Angeles. She's just prior to that finished a season for HBO, a comedy series which will come out in November. Plug. It's going to be huge. Called Vice Principles. Uh, She's now um, talking about writing her first full-length screenplay. She's done two movies. She's made two films, short movies, 15 minutes each. The second one, which was done off Kickstarter, uh, where she got $25,000 through a campaign. Good for her. Uh, She's written a TV series, which is now with her manager and a whole lot of other people. Uh, the guy who directed *Bridesmaids* is very interested. So this is this is this is this is foresight, and inspiration, and and basic sort of drive. You know, um, I I never had that degree of of um, I could never collect all my faculties together to do that. Um, Did you have any form of silent vision when I was thirteen, fourteen? I would say to myself, "Everyone wants to work in film, of course." who doesn't want to be a film director, especially when you're 13 and you're starting yeah, to yeah. be an open. I yeah. said, maybe if I get into TV by the time I'm 25, 26, and I try to direct for TV, then one day that might give me a, a level playing field. Having that one anchor point always gave me a sort of mm. reference to go. So all of a sudden when someone was like, hey, do you want to come and do this over here? I'd think, is that ultimately, or could it get me to the, the yeah. TV directing role? I actually became a TV director at 23, which was, you know, great right on par. For me, I needed that one silent little vision. Would you say that for people listening to this, it's okay to kind of say, do you know what? I am going to dream quite big, but because by dreaming big, I give myself some sort of reference to keep pointing Yeah, towards. I think that's a good idea. It's interesting to know that you have a, you know, a, a, I suppose a small handful of potential sort of directions. You know, you've got a, you've got a little route map. You could take the, the, you know, route one, route two, route three, possibly route four, whatever. Uh, in my case, I came to the United Kingdom in 1969 um, thinking I might do design, stage design, or I might do acting. Something to do with theatre. Theatre, this wasn't film. Uh, and I fell into auditioning for various drama schools, which no longer necessarily advisable. Um, my daughter didn't go to a drama school. She just went because, you know, a lot of people now say, if you've got the talent, the fire in your belly, then by all means, why waste three years, you know, learning how to fence, learning how to, to, to knit, as it were, learning how to project your voice. Um, all the old skills, which are now less and less required, which is, in my view, a bit of a shame because quite a lot of people I can't understand they, they can't articulate as well as they might. If they had learned how to speak, then it would be easier. Um, so if you're, because this is a big concern, it's one of the reasons I got very interested in this, because I couldn't believe it was possible to see 59, 60, 65 people applying for jobs with a small company like us who couldn't read and write and turn up on time, yet had quite a lot of confidence about the fact that they were going to be a big director and all these sorts of things of why this all started. That led me to look at well, what's going on with creative university courses, and and you know there's there's more on the website about some of the things mm. we, we we're looking at and, and sharing. My biggest concern has been you know that these degree costs these degrees can cost up to forty five thousand pounds. What do you think about you? You just mentioned there about people going to university. If say Fran is here now and she says, well, I'm you know I'm going to try and go and do this, and it's it's three years and it's yeah you know, I'm going to have forty five grand, but I believe I can be a great actor. Would you say? Get out there and try and hustle for a couple of years first. See if you can make it happen with soft skills, practice, build relationships, and and and, and perfecting your technique. What would be? Where would you sit on that without getting too political? Forty-five thousand seems just such a fortune to 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 have to borrow in order to learn. Strikes me as being very retrogressive, very retrograde um, uh, uh, as an idea. Uh, I'm I'm appalled at the thought that 
that people have to borrow in order to gain an insight. Um, I would, my preference would really be to say, if you've got 45,000 quid, I mean, borrow five and use it to see if you can't um, um, go to theatre, look at the, the work at, say, the tobacco factory in Bristol. Go and see what work they're doing. If you like the work there, see if there's anything that you can do um, with the company around the edges, um, acting as an act, as a, I, my first job, when I got the, I got a gold medal at RADA and all the rest of it, bells and whistles, hee-ha, my first job was an acting ASM. Now an acting ASM is, I get a little role on stage, and then I get to make the tea and coffee, I get to pack the skips at the end of a performance, I get to stand on stage so they can light various moments in a production as we move from one city to the next. Amazing. It was not, it was not very elevated, but it was very, very useful because it got me uh, a, a provisional equity card. Uh, in the old days, you had to be a member of equity, which I thought was, a, and I still think it's good to, to be a member of a union. Uh, and it eventually, over weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months, I eventually became a full member because I put in 40 weeks of what you had to do uh, as, an, as, an, a, an, a, as, a, as a junior actor, as it were, before you became a full equity member. Interesting. Now all that's sort of gone, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's dog eat dog now, it's, it's much more, there's, there's, there are fewer structures, there's less support in many ways, uh, all of which I think is entirely regrettable. That's really useful, really insightful, and I think that, you know, it's pause for thought, do, do pause, one thing we've seen is an ushering up of a lot of people, they, 70% of teachers in a new report that's just come out from, um, the House of Lords and the Social Mobility Report has said that 70% of teachers feel like they don't feel qualified to give careers advice and 45% have actually said they feel like they're giving the wrong advice. And I speak to quite a lot of young people who are following their teacher's advice. And I think when I put those two together, I would say just pause and try to seek out resources like this to seek out other people who've been through the profession before you commit to your UCAS form Hmm. And you're 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 getting sweat. Your potential getting sweat up in the in the feeling of this is going to be fun because at 32, when you're saving for a house, I know it sounds all you know old and all this sort of stuff, but and you're paying back. You know the economic realities when you get to my age do have an impact. And if you don't get the value for money, or you've got you know a couple of hundred quid extra coming out your monthly pay packet, you're going to struggle for some of the basic things that you might want as well so question is okay and there's some more stuff on the website to help you with questions to office university open dates a um, couple of very very final questions i know john's short of time we've just come up to the hour mark so i want to bring it to a close um john we won't go into it too much we spoke about history before i know you're a lover of history reading we've spoken about reading you mm. you said when we we're having coffee and cake just before um we started people should study history i'm a big fan of history i spend a lot of time reading historical texts that gives me context it helps me you'd advocate People read as much about history as they can. Yeah, read Shakespeare. Great. And any other, outside of Shakespeare, is there any other historical... I'm a big fan of kind of like, you know, economic history, like how, how are things put together? I find that very useful. Anything outside of Shakespeare? Oh, Lord, yes. I mean, any, any, um, any good uh, historical analysis is going to, is going to reveal both the ambitions and indeed the follies of, of, uh, of future generations. Um, William Dalrymple's book, um, The Last Mughal, The Last Emperor, the, anything by William Dal Dalrymple will throw light on Afghanistan, on India, uh, then you realize that 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 the, the the great army of the indus that was that was destroyed by the afghan um resistance you could call it that by the different tribes people in 1850 whenever it was 1851 was 50, I can't, I can't, off the top of my head middle 1850s anyway uh i think 24000 um 
officers, their wives, their followers, their everything were slaughtered and one doctor managed to survive to get back to Islamabad. And you think, ah, oh, Afghanistan, that great morass of difficulty. And you think, yes, and it's been done before and the mess has been done before and the same has happened again and we've done the same again. Then, of course, we get an insight into why we're failing yet again. Now, that's the value of history, it seems to me. And that's just one instance, you know. What mistakes have you made throughout your sort of 40, 45 year career that you wouldn't want other people to make? Uh, I've walked away from projects that I really could have done uh, through a little bit of um, faint heartedness. I thought, well, that might require a bit too much. Um, um, I was offered, for example, the role of John Maynard Keynes in a Derek Jarman movie, Derek Jarman. People can look, look him up. Uh, a remarkable creator in all sorts of ways. A fabulous character, an amazing human being. Um, an artist, a gardener, a filmmaker, uh, a writer, um, a bon vivant, socialite, um, everything that you could, you could ask for in a human being. And uh, there I did one film with him, which was um, Caravaggio, about the 17th century painter. And that was remarkable. And, and I was offered this role in a film about Wittgenstein. And I, for some reason, I, I can't remember why I didn't do it. I was offered Elliot in um, Brief Life, and what was it, what was it called? Private Lives, uh, with a wonderful director. And for some reason, I just wasn't in the mood. I could have done that. Should have done that. Yeah, I turn down yeah. films all the time because I'm not in the right mood. It's annoying. Yeah, I've really got funny. to get over that mistake. It's just <laughs> dreadful, isn't it? But there, there, are, there are times when I thought, you know, you could have done that and that might have been rather good, but you never know. And at the end of the day, I always think, well, if I didn't do it, somebody probably even better did it. So, so no loss there. Um, very quickly, I just want to touch on, on money. Um, there's a new page on the website, Don't Mention Money. Uh, I know growing up and even now people have find it very hard to talk about money sometimes. I think that uh, I wish I would have started to think about money earlier. So I've had amazing, incredible opportunities, helicopter cameraman, TV director, writer, all these sorts of things. You can see it all on the website. I didn't always pay attention to saving, planning, future and things like that. My point being, as, as pointed out on the don't mention money part of the site is some podcasts on there to help people, millennials, etc., talking about millennials, the situations they're in. Um, but even simple things, I say, if you're 16 or around 16 now, take the idea that by 27, you might set up a company. It might be your own acting company. It might be you setting yourself up as a limited company whilst you try and be an actor or someone working in that um, profession. If you take this concept that maybe each day you maybe spend five pounds on different things, maybe some coffee, some cigarettes, uh, you know, whatever, if you said to yourself, right, when I'm going to reduce that and I'm going to save £2.50 and I'm going to auto save that, I'm going to set up an account each day, I know there's £2.50 each week or I'm going to tally it up after 30 days. If you take that concept between your ages and mine when I set up my company, that amount over the 4,015 days would equate to more than £10,000. With a little bit of interest, you're probably looking at 10500 So at 16, now 16, 17, you could say, well, hey, you know, that's a long way away, but that very simple idea of reducing my coffee spend and going for one coffee and then auto saving. You've just opened a company at 27. You do that with four friends or three other friends, you've got a 40,000 pounds. You've just set up a company for a year where you can pay yourself some money, hire a staff member, get some offices, you're in business. Um, John, without going into specifics, um, is there anything on money you'd like to mention? Obviously in, you know, uh, well, I'll just say, is there anything on money you'd like to mention from the world of acting? I know it's hard sometimes. Well, I, I, I certainly like the idea of p paying into a union. I like the idea of being a member of, of equity. They even have a thing where they have the, the British equity collecting, um, so, so call this collecting society. Dreadful, isn't it? I don't know what these, these um, short terms mean, BECs. But they actually make, they double check to make sure that, that, that if a show that you've been in is, 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 is being um, televised, is being shown in uh, another country somewhere, uh, that country has paid for the privilege of, uh, has bought the, uh, the, the broadcast. 
then BEX will make sure that you get the residual payment. So sometimes they'll send an email saying this amount has gone into your into your bank. Um, that's just an example of being part of an organization that, that actually has the interests of its members um, well and truly, uh, you know, um, looked after. And I think that's very wise. I think great to pay national insurance, put some money, just as, as you were saying, Al, that, that it's great to put some money aside uh, for the future. That's called saving. And that's what everyone does. Don't live on credit if you can avoid it. Don't spend what you haven't got, is what my father always said. How much money do you owe? I said, I don't owe anything. He said, what, you don't have a mortgage? I said, yes, I've got a small mortgage. He said, well, how much do you owe? 30,000 pounds or something. And he said, well, that's what you owe. You owe that money. Don't be deceived. You know, if you owe money, you will owe that money. You have to pay it back. Be careful. That's what I say. Absolutely. And also, you know, saving is great but actually maybe think of it as investing you reduce that cup of coffee today and also save that two pound fifty actually you're investing in an idea in 10 11 years time you're investing in your own future you do that with four things a week which reduces it by 10 and put that into an account you've just set up your business you've just you know bought your plane ticket to new york to go and meet with other actors all sorts of amazing things so um final two points um this one's from fran What's one thing that acting has taught you about yourself as a, as a person? What have you learned as a person? Has it made you change or become a... Well, I'll just shut up and let her question do the talking. I, mm, it's a, what's it done? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Given I you don't know life, what it's done. Given you a, a, a quite an interesting and varied life. I, I've had a wonderful time. I mean, I, 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 the, to be able to... Um, uh, John La, the writer John La, described actors as um, technicians of the spirit, which I think is quite a nice, quite a nice term, really. That you look at human behaviour, you look at all social behaviour, which you have to do when you're doing a role. You find out who am I, what do I want, how do I get it, essentially. So you're you're usually asked to step outside of your normal comfort zone, which is important, very important, that we do. It's a, it's a re relatively high-risk business. Um, quite a lot of actors crash and burn because, because it, does, it does take a toll. It does require that you do sacrifice a certain amount of nervous energy you know, in order, to, in order to, to, to do the job. Um, but that requires you know, a, strong, a, str a reasonably strong philosophical sense and a fairly strong sense of how absurd life is, essentially. So don't take the job too seriously, but of course, commit completely to it. And of course, everything we've discussed, discussed today about your acting, your experiences and the soft skills, the things that anyone can use today to start opening up opportunities. Of course, acting is just one part of the industry where there's, uh, there's yeah. hundreds, if not thousands of roles, and people can use what we've talked about for any of those roles, not just necessarily if they're interested in acting now, they can actually be a you know, stagehand or a lighting yeah. technician or, you know, an editor. That. Yeah, whatever it is that gets you, gets you, you know, gets you into a, 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 a workplace that's of interest to make your way through that. I mean, I don't know of anybody really who's just walked straight in and become, you know, a, a star. I mean, it does happen. Somebody, somebody's plucked out of a drama school and Kenneth Branagh was one. Ken Branagh, they Deservedly. saw him do an amazing performance. Then he was offered Henry V, I think, at, at, uh, at Stratford almost immediately. And there's been a number of those. And that's just, that's just high-octane high, high good luck, I he, call that. He's, uh, he's one of my favourite actors. I was watching Shackleton the other day. I absolutely love him. I came across him quite late, only in the last, say, six, seven years ago. When, very quick point, you make your own opportunities happen. I've got into drama school even though... I never wanted to act. I just taught myself the different roles and drama was one I'd not put myself under the pressure of. But when I was 22, I said, do you know what, I want to work on a film set. Everyone said, you can't work on a film set. How are you going to do that? I was still at university. I said, I don't know. I went online. I found a website, I think it's called starnow.com. You could register as an extra. I registered my details, a bit of a silly photo. Well, I put a photo on there, a professional looking photo, I guess. Um, two days later, I got a phone call from a casting agent saying we were shooting a World War I film. Uh, well, it's the Magic Flute, is an opera. We're setting it in World War I. We need 200 young looking 
guys to play soldiers and run through the fields. A week later, I was on a film set which Kenneth Branagh was directing, interacting with the crew, running around, being paid, got paid £200, £250 a day. We basically sat around, we ate bacon sandwiches, we got given a gun. Um, I actually left mine up against the side of a warehouse, which I wasn't allowed to do, whilst I went for a, a, a pee and then someone took it and I got in trouble. But apart from that, it was fine. Kenneth Branagh was there, said hello to us all, very, very nice. Um, I've got photos. That happened within a week because I said, here's an idea, I'd like to do this, how can I make it happen? So I'm talking there about the importance of strategy, mm. imagination, strategy, and going for it, and using my soft skills. Apart from leaving the gun up against the wall, the reason why that happened was because of soft skills yeah. and taking a yeah. chance. Finally, what is success to you? Is it being on the big screen of a massive film or doing a great theatre show, or is it living a balanced, healthy life where possible and, 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 and trying to be involved in creative projects with creative people? All of that and much, much more. All of those things. Well, this is brilliant. Um, this has been great. I, I've got one more point. This is Jack, who I mentor. He's 17. He says, um, you starred in a film called Anaconda with Jennifer Lopez. Yes. Um, which she was also in. Do you have her phone number and can he get it? Um, that's from Jack. Actually, that question might have come from me. On that note, we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll call it a day. John, is right. there anything else you'd like to say? No, that's no. grand. Thank you very much for your time. Grand. My pleasure. It's been awesome. Thank you. <laughs>